Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I don't know. So we're going to get started. I know it's early. It's 8.30. Hope some people come in. Um, we're grateful that everybody came back for more sessions. <laughs> so this morning, the session is on managing conflict of interest. Um, but before we get started, we wanted to go over our land acknowledgement statement again. Please take time to read that. We're very grateful and thankful that we get to be part of um, the land here and that our universities participate in part of this uh, sacred place. Take time here. And uh, this morning, we're joined by um, three very knowledgeable people. First, Dr. Andrew, Andrew Kopish, who is an Associate Vice President for Research in the Vice President's Office here at Northern Arizona University. He's also a professor mm -hmm. of chemistry, biochemistry. Associate professor, but. Associate professor, yeah. <laughs> okay. And, uh, and uh, we're joined by Scott Pryor, who recently came from the University of Arizona to Northern Arizona University. He's also an associate vice president for research compliance. So he's our new research compliance officer, which we're very, very happy to have. Um, and I'll let them go on about some of their uh, credentials and things. And then we also have Brent Sarin from Arizona State University, who is a conflict of interest manager, I believe. Um, and he works in their Office of Research Integrity and Compliance and Assurance. And um, anyway, we'll go from there. Take it away. All right. Well, thanks, Chris. Uh, appreciate it. And um, I think uh, I think could we move the slide back? I can't do that, right? Okay. No problem. All right, so um, as Chris said, our talk this morning is Institutional Management at Conflicts of Interest. Uh, Brent, uh, Scott, and myself are all uh, taking turns covering some of the slides. And um, we're going to be managing the slides remotely. So to the other speakers, if you, whenever you wanna have the slides move, just say so and we'll, we'll take care of it, so. All right, sounds good. All right. So I think Scott, I think you're Great. Yeah. First. Awesome. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, and uh, happy Turak conference. Hope it's been going great. I'm sure it has. And I'm sorry that I can't be there in person. Um, <clears throat> so the session that we've designed today is um, what we're trying to cover several different bases. And we bring a variety of perspectives um, and varying levels of expertise. Chris was kind to, to include me in, in extensive expertise related to COI. I will um, admit, you know, I'm two months into the job here at NAU and, and learning a lot about conflicts of interest. And so um, I'm bringing kind of a beginner's perspective to it, which um, will hopefully be helpful and some of you can hopefully relate to. Um, but Brent and Andy both bring a, a, a wealth of experience from both research administration perspective on Brent's front, um, which he will address, and then Andy's perspective as a, as a faculty member. So we're also hopeful that this will be a very interactive um, session. You know, each institution has to make their own decisions about how to manage conflicts of interest. And so things will vary a little bit from institution to institution. So. Um, please use the Q and A um, session if you or, the, or feature if you are attending via Zoom, um, and let us know your thoughts. We do have a scenario that we'll get to at the end um, that will hopefully be a good launching point for some good discussion. Um, but we'll start off with with addressing the different perspectives from which we engage with um, issues of conflicts of interest. So if we could go to the next slide, please and just give you a little sense of, of our um, agenda for the next hour and, and change. Um, so 
first off, we'll address, you know, what, why are we even here talking about conflicts of interest? I always like kind of starting things off to, to situate our conversation. And then we're going to address three different perspectives. Um, first, the institutional perspective, um, which I'll handle. Then Andy will take over and provide um, some insight into the faculty perspective on COI. And then Brent will address the research administrator perspective. So we're really hoping that at the end of this, you as research administrators and, and you know people who support our researchers will have some um, insight and some resources to, to, to help be a, a collaborator and a great supportive um, partner to, to our faculty and, and researchers. So why are we here? Um, so go ahead and go to the next slide, please. We're here because conflicts of interest, and, and we're using that term somewhat broadly today, so it includes financial conflicts of interest, it includes you know, conflicts of commitment related to time and effort, um, but we're going to be mostly just sticking with the conflicts of interest or COI kind of designation, but just keep in mind that is kind of an umbrella term. So any of those, any conflicts of interest have the potential to inappropriately bias or appear to bias the design, conduct, and reporting of research. Um, and perception here is key. So, so just even though it, it, it isn't actually, you know, it, even though bias is not actually in place, if there is the perception of bias, we have to be careful about that as well. Okay, next slide, please. And our goal, right, as institutions, as researchers, as administrative support staff is to collectively protect the integrity and objectivity of research by ensuring that that research is free from bias that's resulting from a researcher's conflict of interest or an institution's conflict of interest. We're focusing primarily on research, um, you know, kind of on the faculty um, who are engaged in research, but do you want to um, remind folks, right, that conflicts of interest can also exist at the institutional level. Okay, next slide. So just keeping that overarching goal, you know, what we're trying to do as institutions, as researchers, as research administrators, um, is and funding agencies really, right, is protecting the research and the integrity of the research. So we're going to introduce the scenario, something that I'm sure many of you have, have experienced. Um, and if not, you probably will at some point. So go ahead and go to the next slide. We're not going to discuss this right now, but just to kind of seed your thinking. So let's say um, you're, you know, a research administrator, a faculty member approaches you and asks you to meet about, um, hey, I'm working on this new NIH proposal. I'm really excited. Can, can I meet with you to go over the budget? So you all get together and meet and you're kind of chit chatting. And they also just happen to mention, you know, talking about sort of what else they're working on. It's like, oh my gosh, I just got this really awesome consulting job that I'm doing on the side with a private company. So that's the little scenario. Um, again, just kind of put that there in your mind, and then we're going to circle back around to that at the end to uh, have some discussion. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so just to establish uh, some some framework for for the rest of our session, um, and these are going to be some some phrases that you will hear um, several times because they're really important. So first of all. Conflicts of interest in COI is primarily, from the researcher's perspective, about disclosure of outside activities and interests, okay? And when we say disclosure, we're talking about disclosures by the investigator to the institution at which they work and to the sponsor, if, if they're doing sponsored research, okay? Federal sponsors, as well as institutions, both provide several opportunities throughout the course, right, of the research life cycle for investigators to make those disclosures. And we'll get into some of the details there. Next slide, please. So just a kind of visual graphic there of what, what I just said on the previous slide, right? But here, you know, in Arizona for researchers at our state institutions, um, we ask our researchers to disclose to, if they're at NAU, at NAU, U of A, ASU, um, through, you know, we each have our own systems 
for making those disclosures, but it is a requirement for, for each institution. And, and Brent will talk about this in greater detail, each of the federal funding agencies have disclosure requirements, and those happen at various points in the proposal cycle and continuing um, you know, progress reports, et cetera. Okay, next slide. Okay, so just to, to step back a little bit and think about, um, you know, the institution's perspective, whether U of A, ASU, and NAU, and just a caveat here that these next few slides are, are very general, right, and to, to emphasize that each institution is going to be a little bit different in terms of what the actual processes um, and interpretations, right, of level of risk that um, the institution wants to take on as it relates to conflicts of interest. Um, so just keep that in mind. Okay, next slide, please. So I think we we wanted to to underscore that um, conflicts of interest have a negative connotation, but they're actually permissible, and in some ways they're increasingly encouraged. Um, you know, each of our institutions, state institutions in Arizona, have um, tech launch and entrepreneurial arms that are really interested in trying to take the intellectual property that is generated by faculty in the course of their work at each institution and licensing it, um, encouraging those faculty to create startup companies that can then license the intellectual property from the university. And this is the result of federal legislation, the Bayh-Dole Act, um, that, that really said, hey, if we as taxpayers are investing all this money in research, we want to see that research have real impact and economic impact. So the goal is really to move the, the knowledge generation that's happening in the course of research out into the marketplace. So, so there's a legal framework, a, you know, a legislative framework that says, hey, this we we are pursuing um we are actually asking you as researchers to engage in activities that create kind of inherently conflicts of interest so at the institutional levels our policies our abor policies our institutional policies you know, there's no specific prohibition against engaging in outside activities um having conflicts of commitment or having outside financial interests as long as they are disclosed and, if necessary, appropriately managed. There is an important caveat, right? There is a limit, right? So in some cases, there are going to be certain kinds of conflicts that simply cannot be managed. And the, the results um, in, in those cases um, would be that the conflict would actually need to be eliminated, okay? So there's a real spectrum in terms of conflicts that that can exist and be appropriately managed to you know if, if ones are egregious and there's real concern about the conflict actually having you know um again affecting inappropriately biasing the research then then there may be cases where the institution has to say look this conflict cannot exist and we actually need to take steps to remove the conflict okay next slide so stepping back, you know, what is the institution's responsibility? And this, this list here is pretty standard across our um, federal regulations in terms of what, um, you know, our sponsors expect of institutions. Um, but these are primarily taken from the, um, the public health services, PHS um, regulations. So it's expected, right, that an institution has policies and procedures addressing conflicts of interest. The expectation is that institutions have a designated official or officials um, to manage and oversee the COI process. Um, we have to have training and education. We have to actually take steps to manage any financials of commit, uh, conflicts of interest and any conflicts of commitment. We're obligated to report to sponsors as required in their specific regulations. We're obligated to maintain records and finally, to ensure that policies are enforced. Um, 
So that's, you know, in a, in a very simple nutshell, what each institution um, is obligated to do in order really to receive federal funding. Okay. And next slide, I think, is that my last one? Okay, yeah, and just to underscore, and we'll circle back, we'll repeat this on several occasions, but just to emphasize that, again, the, the your role, if you're a research administrator supporting a faculty member, um, you know, the message that we really want to drive home is that it's the investigator's responsibility to disclose. It is not their responsibility to determine whether they have a conflict. Okay, it's really only the institution's designated official or officials that have the authority to, to make a determination about whether or not a conflict exists. So again, just our message here today is disclose, 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 and encourage your investigators to do to, to disclose. Um, so I think that's my last slide on kind of the institution perspective. And we're, now we're going to turn things over to, to Dr. Kopisch to talk about the faculty perspective. All right. Well, thanks, Scott. That was a great introduction to, you know, just what COIs are, how each institution varies in their capacity and their uh, their process that they have to, to handle them. Um, what I wanted to do was just sort of, you know, speak more from my role as a faculty member and less as a role as an administrator to just talk about, you know, what your average faculty member uh, kind of hears and kind of thinks about when he thinks about um, conflicts of interest. So okay, just... Uh, sure. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll do my best. You know, as as Scott said, um, it's <clears throat> conflict of interest often has a a very you know negative connotation when when faculty hear the words, uh, but increasingly, as he also mentioned, that sponsors themselves are uh, are hopeful. That the work that they're funding will also have benefits in a more broader sense to communities or to economies and what you're seeing here is uh just a single example is the nsf i hub desert and pacific region uh program that is hosted by the nsf but all three institutions in the state uh asu u of a and nau are part of this the entire point of this program is to encourage entrepreneurship from people who have had NSF um, funding. Um, now, that said, not all faculty may have even considered this. They may not have given a thought to any type of outside activities. And things like the i or or other types of encouragement that we may want to provide to faculty may be their first entrance into thinking about how their work could be applied to an entrepreneurial uh, setting. But in short, universities do benefit from that. Uh, sponsors benefit from that. Um, and uh, even though, you know, it's it's conflict of interest can may sound opposing or 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 threatening to some people, it's really not. It's 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 designed to be a process to just make sure all of our ducks are in a row. So you, uh, move to the next slide, please. Again, I think as a faculty member, one of the, the biggest challenges we have is just hearing those words conflict of interest and immediately uh, recoiling from it. You know, I, I think as a faculty member, if Scott and I were talking and he led into me talking about COI in the way that he did, I would feel a lot better than if I just read it on a page. But I can tell you as a faculty, I usually skip as far down the page as I can and start reading when I think I need to. And it's usually at the stage of conflict. So, um, but as as we mentioned before, it's, it's really uh, an educational process that faculty benefit from. When disclosures are necessary, why they are necessary, truly understanding that this isn't a punitive measure. This is 
this is uh, is is a, a back and forth between the university and the and the um, and the faculty to just make sure that all of the work that they are doing is not unwittingly putting anybody crosswise in a way that the university wouldn't want. Ultimately, you know, the faculty are the ones who have to make the decision to disclose. Faculty often will ask questions, and I'm as guilty of this as anyone, probably more guilty than than most, of trying to resort to, you know, research administrators. Well, do I need to disclose this? Who should I disclose that to? What about this? All of all the things that I have, what do I need to disclose? We'll talk about that more in Brent's section, but it's research administrators who do not have a role in recommending anything. It's the it's the investigators who have to disclose the work. Universities themselves will then make a decision on if conflicts exist, and if they do, how to manage them. But that said, the more uh, transparent this process can be, um, both from the university side as well as encouraging the faculty to be uh, trusting and transparent as well, the smoother this process occurs. And again, that is the part that invariably takes the most work just because as I as I, I'll go through here in a moment, we we are unfortunately saddled with a, a fairly negative connotation surrounding all of this. Could you uh, move to the next one, please? Thanks. So, you know, it's one thing to just say transparency and trust are what we need, but in reality, there's roles uh, both on the faculty side as well as the university side to establish that relationship. And I think, you know, it's, it's worth considering um, where the faculty's uh, point of view is as they approach the process. And it's also important to recognize where the faculty have gaps in that point of view. So what I'm what I have here on this slide is just kind of talk about you know as, as an average faculty member when you're uh, entering into a conversation about your work uh, and opportunities that might be available given what your where your expertise is. Um, the first thing is that you know faculty do have the most knowledge about their expertise than anyone else. Uh, they not only know what they know, but they know how it can be applied. And oftentimes they'll able to quickly and readily recognize opportunities that might be presenting themselves. That's a good thing from the university standpoint because we want nimble researchers who are able to take advantage of opportunities when they arise but this often complicates the COI process simply because um, that can happen pretty quickly and it can happen before the university has really had a chance to, you know, discuss. So part of this as well is that, you know, faculty are often um, have a have a very keen understanding that opportunities don't, they can be fleeting. They can be here today and gone tomorrow. And so maybe even when that's not necessarily the case, there is a, a feeling between a lot of people that, oh, geez, this is a great opportunity. I got to jump on it right now. And maybe, but more than likely, um, uh, if that's the case, that means we need to get the discussions around the conflict going uh, a lot faster as well. So could you uh, move to the next? Thanks. Now that said, um, faculty don't always have all of the information you, we would want them to have. And I can say uh, I didn't have this type of information or all the information about the conflict of interest process um, until I started working in research administration. And even then, it's been uh, a process that there's been growth and in, in, in an understanding that develops over time. The biggest place that faculty, I think the gap that we as research administrators need to bridge is that they simply don't have an understanding of where conflicts might be or really a way to assess them. Oftentimes, they're just too close to the work to really be able to see how another objective entity might see the same set of data. 
So it's really easy for a faculty to say, oh, well, you know, I do this, they do that. And clearly, I mean, I'm not, there's no conflict there. It's easy for them to not only skip the disclosure part, but also to conclude that there's not a conflict. That's not their role. That's the institutional officials role. And again, it's not a punitive thing. Um, it's, it's a conversational thing. Uh, faculty don't always appreciate that they are um, working as a team with the universities and with the sponsors. Uh, they may have some, uh, you know, appreciation that, I mean, certainly they understand that they are employed by the university, but they don't always appreciate that the university has a stake in their success, a stake in the work that they do, as does the sponsor. Um, <clears throat> the third point is really the biggest one, is that it is a very challenging thing um, to communicate that the COI process is not about modifying behavior so much as it is about understanding where things may need to be managed and that the management process isn't a black mark for anybody. It's just the way that we need to do it to make sure that all is uh, above board as going forward with the work. And, you know, um, oftentimes they don't have a good understanding or a complete understanding of, of where the sponsor um, sits in this and what rules that they may have. So just to kind of, uh, you know, give you a, a bit of a window into the faculty mindset, um, and it's easy to, to, you know, forget, but, you know, faculty are team players. Uh, everybody, if you sit down with them one-on-one -on -one and you explain to them in a way that they, makes them understand, look, we really need to get on the same page here, they will. I mean, it's, it, there's nobody who I've ever encountered in my professional career who would deliberately run counter uh, to what we're telling them that needs to happen um, if we can give good rationale for that. And, and, and as I said before, the goal to facilitate that discussion is transparency and trust. Now, that said, uh, faculty often just don't know all the rules. So that can be a good conversation is just to educate them on what the rules are. They may not know the rules. Uh, they often may underappreciate their potential for having conflicts and easy to you know see how you don't have a conflict but it's really the institution that needs to make that dis that uh assessment uh and it's it, it's as anything you can be too close to the subject to really be objective about where potential uh concerns may arise um so yeah maybe uh next slide so and again, I, I've said this several times, but the biggest challenge that I personally have encountered with conflicts of interest on both sides of the coin have been that we're unfortunately working with, um, it's very easy to feel as if there's some punitive measures or some type of um, measures that could slow down your progress as a, as a researcher. Um, you know, Faculty can easily just say, oh, you know, I, I just want to get through this as fast as possible, which that really isn't uh, what we like, because that would lead to cutting corners that the whole point is not to cut corners. Um, it's good to just, you know, I, the, the more and more we can communicate that the university is vested in long term success. That's the whole point of the i -Corps program uh, of the work and the researcher. Um, that's nice to reinforce that way. You know, some faculty may uh, have a perception that it's not a big deal to the sponsor. Um, that's not always the case. That's often not the case. Uh, and it's easy to forget when you're working with sponsors that they aren't just some big faceless entity that's represented by a logo. There are real people on the other side of that often that are very vested. Program managers can be very vested, are very vested into the programs that they support. And so if they want to know about conflicts of interest and how they're being managed. They certainly don't want to uh, be made aware of it um, in, in a state that kind of backs them into a corner. So, so. Now, <clears throat> I think this is one of my last slides, but uh, 
this is a, a quote that I, as a faculty member, used to like to roll out, and I'm sure everyone in this room has heard it abundantly. Um, and now, as someone who is kind of on the other side of it, I'm not quite as fond of it <laughs> as I once was. Uh, but it's, you know, easy to say this, and but what you're really saying is, you know, I'm just going to pretend uh, all is fine. And if it's not, then you can tell me. Um, and I, the only thing I have to say is that, you know, we, we ideally want to not get to that place if we can. Um, how to do that is really just to, part of that conversation, just to actively make sure that, you know, this whole point of this process is to make sure that uh, we're establishing a mutual relationship that everyone is comfortable with. And that, you know, if the, the stick to that carrot necessarily is that um, if things do go in a direction we don't want, there are, uh, you know, that's when sponsors can can be unhappy or that's when the university can step. Up. So uh, I think I think that's it for me. So I'll switch over to, to Brent now. Thank you. My name is Brent Saren. I work for Arizona State University. I'm the COI RCR manager. And today I'll, pre I'll be presenting the research administrator's perspective. Next slide, please. So you might be wondering, for those that don't know me, what do you know about being an RA, Brent? Well, I've got about 10 years being an RA. Uh, I started off at the University of Nebraska Medical Center, uh, where I devoted about two years to uh, related to pre-award support. Then I moved to Arizona uh, and uh, started off at Arizona State University College of Health Solutions. And then after three years, I went to the College of Engineering, where I was there about five years. And I left quite recently in January of 2023 to what I, I like to joke, uh, I joined the other side of the FNA rate in research compliance. So I've got a pretty good grip on research, uh, the RA perspective, right? So next slide, please. Okay, first and foremost, for those, uh, for those RAs that are listening, uh, this presentation is for the brand new RAs and the battle and the battle hardened RAs. So if you are a if you are a battle hardened RA and you are working on a proposal, well, if you got to work on a proposal while you're listening to this, you got to do that proposal, right? Uh, <laughs> but if you are not working on a proposal, uh, tune in. I guarantee you, those battle hardened RAs, you're going to learn something for sure. Or perhaps I might inspire you to uh, devote a little bit more time to this. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, and another thing that I just want to uh, emphasize in my presentation is that I really am going to be covering disclosure made to federal funding agencies. Uh, as uh, Scott and Andy sort of alluded to, there is disclosure requirements to our institutions, but for, for what I'm going to be talking about, uh, it's disclosure to federal funding agencies and it, within the pre-award phase of the research life cycle. Next slide, please. So disclosure. We kind of know what disclosure means now, but what are we really talking about? We're talking about uh, what federal, fundies, federal funding agencies ask of the investigators. And what they ask of the investigators is to disclose, for example, business positions, outside employment, outside appointments, regardless of whether that entity is involved in the research project. That's pretty important. Next slide, please. Disclosure where? So this is pretty interesting. Uh, it's disclosure in the bio sketch, disclosure in the current and pending other support, and disclosure in other documents as needed. Uh, and sometimes it's in the facilities document, right? Next slide, please. So to recap, investigators are asked to disclose the relationships with outside entities within their current and pending and bio sketch, regardless of whether that entity is involved in the project. 
Next slide, please. So where is this requirement? You're like, Brent, you're crazy. I don't believe you. Where is this requirement? Uh, it's within the SF-424 application instructions, uh, NIH. NIH has a great disclosure table. And many of you, especially the battle-hardened RAs, have looked at those disclosure tables and sort of shook your head at them. But they provide additional details and what the sponsor's expectation is for disclosure. NSF has got a disclosure table. NSF has got some pretty good expectations on what they want to see in those documents, primarily the biosketch and current and pending uh, within the PAPPG, right? Uh, the Department of Energy, they do a really good job of detailing what their expectation is on what they want to see in the current and pending document. Other sponsors like Department of Defense, you can use the NSPM 33 disclosure table to help them decide, to help faculty decide what's disclosed in the current and pending and bio sketch uh, documents. Um, yeah, so I mean, it's there, there are resources out there for you to become familiar with on where those disclosures should occur. Next slide, please. So where else? We talked about uh, funding opportunity announcements, specifically Department of Energy. But uh, you know, I know all those brand new RAs read every single word of the funding opportunity announcement. Maybe the battle-hardened RAs have uh, sort of skim them these days. You know, the last couple of years when I was an RA, there's a lot of skimming of FOAs going on. But I challenge you to read that FOA. Uh, do a control F for conflict, right? And really understand because a, a specific FOA might have additional details on how they want that um, they want that disclosure reported, or or maybe there's restrictions on entities where investigators have a relationship with uh, an entity that is involved in the project. There could be additional restrictions that y'all need to be aware of, especially if you can communicate that to the investigators and the research team before they devote the time and energy and putting together, uh, you know, the technical volume and all that other stuff, right? And common forms. Common forms, there's uh, NSF is steward. Uh, everybody knows about, hopefully everybody knows about common forms. There are great instructions within common forms on what their expectation is related to disclosure in the bio sketch and current and pending. Man, I hope uh, the Department of Energy adopts the common forms. Um, since I've been out of the game for a little bit, over a year now, I'm not quite sure where it is with that, but I have done some current and pendings for DOD sponsors and uh, listing addresses of sponsors and stuff like that. Uh, that's That stuff is brutal. I hope they go to common forms. So uh, it makes the disclosure requirement a lot more clear for those investigators, right? Okay, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so yeah, so that is a surprised face emoji. And Andy already said this, federal sponsors, we don't wanna see their faces. We don't wanna see PMs, POs. We don't wanna see them have the surprised face, right? Related to if, a, if an entity is involved in a project at all. We don't want them to be surprised. We want to be proactive with, with, our, uh, with our communication with the sponsor. We want to make sure they're not surprised. We want to be proactive and transparent from the get-go and using the tools and resources that the sponsors provide institutions to be clear and transparent, right? So I tell you what, if, if, in a, if, in, if there's an entity that's involved in the project, they, either as a subaward, consultant, whatever, uh, and uh, the investigator is concerned about it, uh, put it in the technical volume. Advise them to disclose it wherever they can. They can put it out in front of the sponsor, so the sponsor really understands that there is a relationship, right? So, so you're not basically what I'm trying to say is you're not limited to the biosket, biosketch, current pending facilities, etc. Put it anywhere, right? Next slide, please. So COI, 
I'm so glad that I got to touch upon this again. Um, and we're really sort of driving this point home. Who determines COI? Uh, because as an RA, there was a, a small handful of times that I was pressured into helping an investigator sort of determine COI and determine whether or not they needed to disclose it to a federal funding agency and or the institution. And y'all shouldn't be put in that situation, okay? Uh, so uh, who determines COI? Uh, I could tell you who doesn't, and that is the RA. The investigator, either the conflicted investigator or the investigator's, you know, co-I, co-PI, their colleague, the project PI, or the school director, deans, etc. Those folks don't uh, determine COI. Next slide, please. There, each institution has designated folks that help determine COI, whether it's the institution official whether it's a conflict of interest administrator or uh, somebody in a similar position, those folks determine COI. And what's important about this, they determine COI almost always in collaboration with the investigator with the disclosed interest, right? It's, uh, it's a collaborative process, okay? Next slide, please. Oh, I haven't forgotten about my post award people. I love my post award people. Um, here's something for you, post award. Hey, pre award, this is good for you to know too. If COI is determined, a management plan will be implemented. A plan monitor, a third party plan monitor, is going to be assigned in many cases at Arizona State University. This is the case. I'm not quite sure at U of A, NAU. Uh, but uh, a third party plan monitor will be assigned to that management plan to ensure compliance with that management plan. Post award RAs, we're going to need, we're, oftentimes, we're going to need your help because those plan monitors are going to have to, uh, in some cases, uh, help you determine or help you with a, I don't know, a report, like a financial report, something like that, uh, help determine if or I guess help the plan monitor determine that all expenses, all financial activity related to that disclosed entity, whether it's a sub award, consultant, et cetera, uh, are, uh, what is it, reasonable, allocable, allowable, that type of stuff. So you might, you might help the plan monitor produce some financial reports. So they might be reaching out to you, right? Um, so don't be surprised if you get an email from a faculty member saying, hey, I'm a uh, COI management plan monitor, and I need to confirm this. Can you help me? Be helpful. Be helpful. They're going to need you. Um, and another thing that's sort of uh, sort of uh, a good point to to know that investigators during the period of performance, investigators are required to disclose new relationships during the period of performance. Next slide. So you say, Brent, that investigators are asked to disclose relationships during the period of performance. Yes, they are. And there's a certain time frame that they need to disclose. I think it's 30 days. Uh, and how do they do that? Well, they disclose on uh, sponsor project reports and per sponsor requirements. Uh, and again, it's all about, uh, and that's okay, it's all about the, uh, the relationship that the investigators have with the program managers, program officers, making sure that there's transparency in, in any entity that, uh, that they have that might be, that somehow might intersect with the project, getting out ahead of it, being proactive. So you all might be interested in what's in a management plan. Uh, this is kind of something cool that when I first started, I, as an RA, I never saw a management plan, right? So it was kind of cool to, to see one. They're really simple. They're not draconian. Uh, and uh, the vast majority of management plans is about uh, transparency with the project team, the, your project team members. So the investigator needs to be transparent and they need to disclose 
that they have a relationship with that entity to PIs or to co-PIs, to co-Is, to grad students, postdocs, RAs that are managing their projects, right? Really just saying, hey, I have this relationship that I need you to be aware of. Disclosure to human subjects. And when they publish the results of the research, disclosure to the journals. It's really as simple as that. The vast majority of management plans is just disclosure. So, uh, so as Andy pointed out, there, you know, faculty oftentimes freak out about COI, COI management plans, but at the end of the day, the vast majority of it is about disclosure, just communicating, right? Uh, and every once in a while, there's a small handful of management plans that uh, that require the conflicted investigator. To, ref to refrain from any financial approvals related to that entity and any contractual actions related to that entity. That's sort of a small handful. Uh, next slide, please. I can't remember if I... Uh, so before I go on to if there's anything else that I need to know as an RA, um, what was I going to say? Oh, I can't remember. That's all right. So if is there anything that I, that I need, anything else that I need to know as an RA when I deal with these types of situations? Um, you know, oftentimes when you get yourself into these situations, you have these conversations with faculty, um, you feel awkward, uh, don't. It's completely normal. Uh, it's very common. At Arizona State, we've got like 90 management plans. It's much more common than you think, right? So uh, go easy on them and be helpful to the faculty because they're probably already stressed out about submitting a proposal, let alone having an entity involved in the proposal that they have, an, that they have a financial interest in, right? So they're probably already kind of freaking out. So go easy and be helpful. Understand that faculty have a lot of disclosure requirements. At Arizona State University, currently, there's three institutional disclosure requirements on top of the disclosure requirements uh, for federal funding agencies within biosketches and current and pendings, et cetera, right? So they're disclosing like mad. They almost have disclosure fatigue, right? So understand that the situation that they're in. And uh, it, it, when you put yourself in their shoes, uh, you, you can be kind of sympathetic uh, to, to them a little bit, right? Uh, so next slide, please. So uh, how, can, how can RAs be helpful? Uh, you can uh, know your institution's resources. Teams, I think everybody's got Teams, Microsoft Teams. Teams chat your, your COIAs. Figure out who your COIAs are. Teams chat them just to say hi, right? Uh, my, I, I think my Rockstar uh, COI colleague, Shyla is on here. She'll, at a drop of a hat, she'll respond to a Teams chat. If you have any questions, Teams chat us, email us, uh, set up a Outlook meeting just to say, hey, it's much easier if I just, you know, talk to you in person about the situation. Understand the federal disclosure requirements. And when I say federal disclosure requirements, I'm specifically talking about brush up on the biosketch requirements and the current and pending requirements. Brush up on those. That's primarily what it is. Brush up on those so you understand what is expected of faculty within that document. So if you get questions from fac faculty, you can speak knowledgeably about uh, that situation. And know that there are institutional resources. Uh, everybody's got pretty decent COI uh, resource pages at our institutions. So um, you don't have to be a COI expert. We're not asking you to be a COI expert by any means. We don't, in fact, we kind of don't want you to be a COI expert, but we, want, <laughs> but we want you to be helpful to faculty if they just have a basic, basic question, like, you know, where do I disclose this, right? Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, for example, the, be the best way to learn, the best way to learn this is to uh, get, put yourself up or build a resource for yourself, build yourself a template. 
So when you're aware of a situation, you can say, okay, well, you know, I understand that you have this relationship. Here's where to disclose it. Here's what sponsors uh, ask of you related to disclosure. And uh, if you have any questions about disclosure, you can contact your, uh, your COI folks and they can help you. And uh, quite honestly, I think that this is, oh yeah, and also advise um, when in doubt disclose. I think I might have uh, removed a few slides within my slide deck, um, and it's 9:22. Are we done at 9:45? Yes. Do you guys mind if I go on for just a little bit? Go for it. Okay. All right. So I think what I removed out of my slide decks is that um, for for the battle hardened RAs, you might be or actually. Yeah, battle hardened, the new RAs, the newer RAs, you might be wondering, Brent, was this disclosure requirement, was it always like this? Was this always a thing, this disclosure requirement? And the answer is no. It, dis disclosing in uh, biosketches and current pendings is sort of kind of a new thing, right? I, rem I, I remember back when I used to work for the uh, University of Nebraska Medical Center, not only did I, uh, I, I basically generated uh, investigators' biosketches, I actually also wrote their personal statements as an RA, <laughs> which is insane for me to think about right now. And then uh, in, with the current impendings, it wasn't too long ago because as a battle-hardened RA, I was so sick of generating current impendings that I trained a student worker uh, to be completely uh, uh, proficient in generating current and pendings. And then, as you all know, uh, RAs would uh, send the current and pendings to the faculty members, and the faculty members would just, just look at them for a, a second or two and say, good to go, upload that sucker within the SF-424 or within NSF's new uh, grant module that I forgot about, which actually liked when I was an RA. A lot of people didn't. Doesn't matter. Anyways, but nowadays, nowadays, it, times have changed. When I was an RA, I thought the bio sketch was to communicate uh, their an investigator's um, uh, capacity, skill level to carry out the goals of the project, which is still true. As an, as a, as an RA, when I was an RA, I thought that the current pending was a document to communicate if the investigator had enough time to carry out the goals of the project, and if the investigator was being uh, uh, was being uh, reimbursed from another federal agency to carry out basically the same project, research overlap, right? But when I took this position not too long ago, I also realized the importance of those documents. It's disclosure. Those documents are also made for disclosure and uh and uh yeah so that's that's another thing that i sort of wanted to drive home which means that the ras that the federal agencies sort of understood that ras were generating these documents for investigators and and the federal agencies were like nope we're not going to have that not anymore not anymore we're going to go ahead and put that put that responsibility on the investigators they're, not only are they going to have to uh, build those documents themselves in Science CV, DOE's got a statement. Not only do they have to build them, they have to certify that those documents are complete, accurate, and current, or else there's going to be penalties. So the risk is now on the investigator to create those documents and make sure those documents are accurate, accurately reflect what the investigator is up to. I hope I didn't cut into it. Did I cut into anything, Scott or Andy? I hope I didn't cut anything with uh, with uh, my my added information. So um, yeah, so I think that's it for me, right? Yeah, if we could just go back to that previous slide real quick, just to close before we... Um, move on to our scenario. And, and Brent, I'm, actually, I'm glad you provided that historical context 
because I think that's an important and, and sort of building on what Andy said from the faculty's perspective, right? That faculty are, we're, we're all evolving and trying to keep up, right? With these changes in sponsor requirements, et cetera. And, and to, to Brent's point and to Andy's point about, you know, go easy and appreciate, have some empathy for the faculty member. Um, I think those of us in the position of trying to partner with faculty to help them understand that there is a conflict of interest, right? That's important for us to have that empathy um, because it's also can feel like a moving target sometimes, right? Around, well, 10 years ago, I didn't have to do this, but now there's this increased scrutiny. So I really think, you know, just driving home this, this kind of final point before we talk about a scenario, you know, this process is about establishing a partnership of trust, right? Um, I do want to point out we are missing a big perspective, a really important perspective in our presentation, and that's the perspective of the sponsors. Um, but to emphasize that there are numerous opportunities to hear directly from the sponsor about why they're concerned, conflicts of conflicts of commitment. Um, you know, coming up in early June, NSF has its big virtual conference, and there will be opportunities and sessions there to hear directly from NSF, um, NIH, similar. So encourage you all, if you haven't already, to seek out those opportunities to hear the sponsor's perspective on why, you know, um, why they're asking investigators to, um, to, to disclose all of this stuff in those biosketches, current and pending. Um, to emphasize what Brent said, you know, research administration um, for, from all areas, from all sides, right, from pre-award to post-award um, to kind of central, the, the COI, conflict of interest um, officials, you know, we're, we all have a role to help here in establishing that partnership of trust. Um, and then to underscore, you know, everyone benefits when um, those conflicts or the potential for conflicts are disclosed and addressed as early as possible. The sooner we can roll up our sleeves and all get in and work together, um, the smoother proposal submissions will go, um, award setup, et cetera. Um, Brent, Andy, any final points to add on that I, that I missed there before we open up for discussion? If you don't mind, I mean, that's such a great point that it's a moving target. Um, you know, I, a day or two ago, just for fun, uh, I went into Science CV and I created a current and pending. I just grabbed a disclosure from uh, from our system, and I attempted to enter that disclosure within a current and pending in Science CV, and it was a square peg round hole, right? So I, I think as RAs, the RA community. They, I think they have a role in letting federal funding agencies within these workshops and things like that understand and know that it's a little awkward using uh, the, the current forms in reporting disclosures. And, uh, and I think I, I'm, I'm just, you know, I've got a pretty good crystal ball around this stuff, uh, if I don't mind saying myself. And I, and I think that I think that it's going to change. It's going to change a little bit. Disclosure requirements, it still might be in a current and pending, but the current and pending might be just a little bit more designed, just a little bit more flexible to provide for disclosure of, you know, non-research uh, project related activities, right? So, um, so again, battle-hardened RAs, keep sharp on it. Um, the new RAs, uh, keep your eye on it and uh, make sure you're taking a look at those requirements, because I do believe it's a moving target and it's gonna change. All right, should we move on to the next slide? So back to the scenario, next slide. So just a reminder um, about what we, what we had introduced at the beginning, um, put yourself, in the shoes of a, of a pre-award um, administrator, research administrator here, and, and one of your faculty member, 
Faculty members approaches you asked to meet about a budget for an NIH proposal they're working on. And during your meeting with them, they happen to mention that, hey, I'm excited about this other work that I just started doing on the side with a private company. So we have a few questions for you, and we really want to open this up to address this scenario. Um, we can also go in other directions, right? Um, we've got just shy of 15 minutes left in the session, and so want to open it up. Again, if you're attending via Zoom, please use the Q&A feature to, to pop in a, either a comment or a specific question. And then Andy, I think if you can help monitor facilitate discussion there in the room for folks that are in person, that would be great. So let's let's open it up. Were you, were you, uh, yeah, I, I take it, Brent and Scotty didn't hear the question or? No. So yeah, if you can repeat. I'll, or... I'll do my best. Uh, so your question is, is basically if when these come up, is the process to work one-on-one -on -one with faculty or is there institutional training that we try to roll out ahead of any conflicts? Is that, or what's the institutional strategy on this uh, in terms of if it's a one-to-one -one arrangement or is is it more of a one-to-one -one arrangement or, or annual training? Hmm. That question is for me. I think for anyone who wants to. Yeah. Do you want to speak to how things work at ASU, Brent? Yeah. So uh, here's our institutional posture related to COI, and that is um, education is the key to compliance. And compliance is, you know, one of those words. But uh, for, first and foremost, we want to make sure that, uh, that faculty have uh, the knowledge all faculty are required to take COI training. All research faculty are required to take COI training every four years. Uh, we we make me and uh, my colleague Shyla, my boss Nancy, she's got a great handle on COI. We always are available to faculty to provide uh, to provide our time and speaking with them related to the requirements. Uh, so we really try to. Uh, we really try to be a resource and we provide educational opportunities for faculty um, and then uh, and then encourage them to get out ahead of things and and sort of also on, on the flip side of that, let them know uh, what the worst case scenario is, you know, uh, which is oftentimes implementation of a management plan and which relates to disclosure, which is what I talked about. Right. Because a lot of the times when they approach us, they're coming from that perspective of uh, what Andy's talked about, right? They're, they're concerned, they're legitimately concerned that they can't do what they wanna do. So if we work with them one-on-one -on -one and educate them, provide them resources, I think we can sort of accomplish what we wanna accomplish. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add that, um, you know, each institution has their own disclosure requirements and training requirements. So as Brent described for ASU, um, and what the trainings are gonna emphasize is the institution's requirement about how often disclosures have to be made to the institution. Um, but I think, you know, my preference and based on what we've saying, you know, the sooner the faculty member can reach out and start with a one-on-one, -on -one, right? Um, yes, they can go ahead and disclose through whatever disclosure system the institution has, and they they're they're required to, right, on, on at least an annual basis. Or if there is a change in their disclosure, then um, at NAU, it's within 15 days we ask. Um, investigators to update their disclosure if something has changed. Um, but 
anytime that can start off with a, picking up the phone or shooting us an email and saying, hey, can we have a discussion, then we're going to be off on an even better foot. Um, so certainly encourage those one-on-one -on -one, um, interactions. Uh, I want to kind of talk about this. In this particular scenario, um, I was very interested uh, in our college. If we only came through our two like this, you know, we working with our RA. Our RA started asking some questions about that company. Like, you know, for instance, uh, we would that inform them number one, if they did outside consulting, there is a policy about that. Have they discussed that with our dean? Have they signed off on an outside consulting agreement? Uh, that's when the disclosure is made at that, at, at that point. Uh, sometimes you say the date, sometimes they don't know that these forms exist, that there's policy exists. So we want to tell them about that. But also in this scenario, I mean, there's so many possible conflicts. You know, maybe and it's happened where there's a private company. The private company might be owned by a spouse, uh, maybe owned by somebody, you know, so there may be some interest there. They may have an investment in that company in some kind of way. But we want to ask questions about the company to get a better idea of what, what that actually means. So sometimes it just means us trying to help them navigate. It's not uh, being accusatory in any way, shape, or fashion. It's just that we want to help you. So that's a, a great comment, and, and um, just to to echo some of it is that you know this the scenario is is uh, um, uh, there's there's a lot of questions inherent within the scenario. The big and the one that was mentioned in the room here was just that you know first thing would have to be some detailed questions about what the company is. There may be a litany of potential conflicts that exist within that arrangement. Um, if, it's, if it's owned by somebody who's close to the, to the investigator or or if there's, you know, familial um, ties there. Um, and from that point, there's an, a lot of connecting within the institution of who else knows about this, who else has looked at it, who else has approved, does the dean know, does the department head know? Uh, it's a great comment. And on the flip side, there may be no conflict here, right? If this faculty member is working on an NIH proposal, let's say they're, uh, you know, um, let's say it's, you know, Dr. Kopish, you know, is a chemist, right? And um, and the consulting he's doing is with a, um, he's super passionate on the side about bicycling, right? And bicycle design. And so he's doing consulting you know, for a couple hours. Um, from an institutional perspective, you know, there's not much relation, right, between the consulting that he's doing and his institutional duties. So um, just to underscore, yes, there's a lot more information that we would need in conversation we'd have to have um, to, to figure out whether there's, there's something there that needs to be managed. Um, we do have a question in the Q&A um about whether what the required disclosure time frames are and i just want to emphasize that it's going to vary a little bit from institution to the institution so for nau um all employees need to disclose within 15 15 days of a change to their disclosure that's our local institutional policy um Brent, can you address ASU? I, I'm 90%, 80% sure that at U of A, it was 30 day window for, for updating and disclosure, but please double check that. Brent, what is it for, for ASU? 30, yeah, 30 days. Yep. 30 days. Sooner, okay. sooner the better. But yeah, absolutely. So we just got our, I think we're at four minutes. Um, any other, these are great questions, comments. I think my main comment is the second question, do they need to disclose? And my answer was to read to them always. There may not be a conflict, but we won't know that until you disclose. So yes, for sure. Great. Even if it's Andy's bicycle company, <laughs> right? <That's> right. <laughs> Just, yeah, <laughs> disclose it. That's a perfect, excellent point. All right. Well, I guess if there's nothing else, uh, thank all of you for, for attending the session and uh, 
certainly all three of us are available after this. If you if you have questions that you want to ask separately, happy to get back to you about it. And thanks to everybody for attending online.